Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Clay Malcolm with Advanta IRA, and today I'm going to be joined by Rocky Vitani, founder and CEO of PrivateLenderLink.com, and we're going to be talking about private lending, specifically for individuals and even more specifically for individuals that happen to be an IRA, so to speak. So there's a little bit of information about me. Again, with Advanta IRA, I've been in the self-directed IRA business for uh, about nine years, and uh, I'm also a self-directed IRA investor. So I'm uh, one of us, and uh, hopefully this information will be helpful for you in terms of your self-directed IRA strategy as well. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about self-directed IRAs, how they work and how they can participate in private lending. And then Rocky's gonna come on and delve into uh, private lending and the specifics of that in much more detail. There will be a question and answer period at the end, of course. So if you come up with questions along the way, please feel free to go ahead and type those into the question box that you have on your console and we will answer those. Absolutely glad to do that. So anything that you have specifically that you want answered, just go ahead and type that in and we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. Thanks for doing that. And I'll start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, Advanced IRA does not give any tax, legal, or investment advice. All the information in this presentation is for educational purposes only. And we certainly encourage you to consult your uh, financial team or your lending team anytime that you are considering uh, an investment for your IRA. And that includes obviously CPA, CFP, attorney, so on and so forth. Lots of times I think disclaimers are uh, just a little bit of a, you know, something that people pass over. But I do like to just stop here and just say that one of the things that this disclaimer does indicate is that at Advanced IRA, as the provider of the account, we really are a pretty neutral part of the equation. And our role in that equation is to make sure that your account is in good standing and the bookkeeping is appropriate so that you get to keep the tax advantages. But the motive force behind the decisions, the investment decisions and the management of the account is up to the account holder. And one of the things that, you know, sometimes surprises people about that is, you know, I think uh, IRAs for many people have been pretty passive for, for a lot of years. And sometimes they haven't even heard about self-directed IRAs where you can actually invest that tax advantage money in alternatives. So hard assets, private assets, alternative assets. And I think that that's primarily due to the fact that when the when IRA started in the 70s, banks and brokerage houses uh, seized on that the rules and they created a business model around it and it's been pretty successful for them. And so lots of times people really haven't looked into all the possibilities that they have when it comes to their account. So at Advanced IRA, we took a little bit of a, a different approach to it. So we've specialized in the record keeping and the account um, custodianship for accounts that want to invest in these alternative assets. And it's still a relatively small percentage of IRA investors that are invested in these alternative assets, but it's growing. And I'll say a little bit about Advanta as well, just so that you know who we are. Uh, we are, we have two offices, one in Tampa and one in Atlanta or Tampa Bay area, one in Atlanta, but we do have account holders in every state. Uh, we're nationwide and our approach to uh, being the provider of your account is to make sure that you have person to person uh, customer service. So you get to talk about the things that you want your account to do, and then we can help you to achieve those from a logistical standpoint and uh, make your experience of that investment as smooth as possible. And a little bit about our company uh, in terms of the background. We're an experienced company. We've been around for almost 20 years. And in fact, a lot of the uh, employees and staff have also, they have a very long tenure. And I think that that's important because the operation of your account really has to do with everything from the granular level, you know, what do I put in this box in this form, all the way up to the conceptual level of, how do I uh, think about this account or, or this investment acquisition? How do I situate it in my account? So on and so forth. So there's a, that experience always comes in handy when we're talking to folks about how they want to achieve their uh, desired investment scenario. We have about $1.3 billion in assets under management. So that puts us as a, a, a company that definitely has enough experience to handle almost any kind of asset as well as any kind of scenario. 
all your uninvested cash. So the cash position for your IRA is FDIC insured up to the limit, of course, but the that means that your cash position is safe while you're choosing your investment. And as I mentioned on the last slide, we really do focus on our company culture and that personal touch of each account holder will have an, uh, an account manager, a go-to person where they can talk about their account, what's happening uh, on a number of levels, and so that you always have a place to go and get your questions answered. And we certainly believe in education as well. So we do a lot of our activity based around trying to get you the information that you might need to manage your account better. So we have events like seminars and these webinars, uh, lunch and learns. We certainly attend uh, networking events and we're trying to be accessible to you so that, again, you can think about your IRA investing. What am I doing now? What, what am I going to do next? The video library is a great resource. We've done webinars for years and they're uh, in the video webinar uh, library. So if you ever have a topic that you want to investigate in more detail, but we don't have a live webinar coming up about that particular topic, you can go ahead and visit the library and be able to get the education that you need. And the blog, of course, is our up to the moment uh, commentary on things that have to do with specific asset types or account types, legislation, uh, COVID-19, those types of things. So if you want to stay up to date, please visit our blog. Uh, that's what it's there for. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of self-directed IRA investing. Self-directed IRAs are not a different account type. All the self-directed part means is that the account holder is going to have some sort of choice in terms of the assets that that account purchases. So the account type actually stays the same. It's a traditional IRA or Roth IRA maybe a SEP or a simple education savings account. So the tax advantages, the contribution rules and the distribution rules of those account types stay exactly the same. The only thing that's really different or that you access by having your account with Advanta IRA, of course, is that you can access those alternative assets. The IRS does not say to IRA providers, hey, you have to handle every asset out there. So that's a business choice that the uh, custodians and the IRA providers uh, make. So at Advanta, again, we've chosen to handle all kinds of alternative assets. So it's these account types and these account types can purchase and benefit from the alternative assets that we're gonna talk about here in a second. So the possibilities are, are quite broad and they're all uh, allowable and have been since the IRA started in the 70s. So real estate, private equity, um, precious metals, and then all kinds of variations. So oil and gas, agriculture, um, different types of hedge funds. And today specifically, we're going to be talking about private lending. And I'm going to go into it a little bit, but of course, Rocky's really going to uh, make a deep dive into this topic and the things that would be uh, a good strategy for you to know when you're thinking about how your IRA is going to invest in that, in that broad asset class. But just to give you a, a sense of the scope of private lending and that IRAs can participate in private lending and benefit from them, IRAs can actually be the originator of notes or they can buy existing notes. That's all fine. The uh, note that you choose or that you originate or that you buy can be secured by collateral or not. The IRS does not weigh in on that. That's really an account holder decision. You may be uh, participating in loans by virtue of an equity participation. So a debt-based fund is sometimes one of the investments that we see that IRAs have. Uh, in that way, it's a little bit different structure, but you're still participating in, in a, uh, a debt-based uh, income stream. The IRA can be the entire lender, or it can be a fractional part of that uh, bigger note. So that is also a, a strategy decision from a from an account holder perspective. And there aren't a ton of rules that, that really come into play when it comes to IRAs and lending, but one of them is obviously that, that uh, the IRA cannot loan to disqualified persons. So the, the structure of the loan or the type of loan, very broad access in that regard, but no, no loans or participation with disqualified persons. And this one, this slide is really uh, mostly about origination, but again, it gives you a sense of how uh, 
many choices that you have as the IRA holder when it comes to participating in the in the loan or the debt uh, instrument that you're going to be in. So think about the idea of you know how much you're going to loan. What is the interest rate going to be? And the interest rate does need to be it does have to be a real economic transaction. So it can't be some kind of sweetheart loan where you're not really expecting the person to <laughs> repay it. Uh, you also it can't be a predatory loan. Obviously, IRAs cannot uh, participate in illegal activities, but uh, but you by, by and large get to choose the interest rate that that fits your needs and that fits the the borrower's needs. Uh, you also choose the length of term. Uh, equity participation obviously has some different terms as well, um, but it can be a combination note where the uh, return on it it could be both uh, interest and equity. That's possible. And due date and delivery, uh, those types of things are uh, details that you work out with your borrower uh, when you generate the note. And again, from our perspective as the, the provider of the account, we're there to make sure that the note or the debt participation that you are desiring gets documented in such a way that it gets to keep the tax benefits. But generating the note is part of the responsibility of the account holder and their borrower and it's pretty easy to set up a lot of people think that this could be a very complex thing but it's 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 really not so you open your account that you can do that online or fill out an application it takes about 15 minutes and in advance will pair you up with your uh, dedicated account manager so that you have uh, again somewhere to turn for any of your questions then you'll fund that account so you've opened the account you've got a, a place for it to be got the account type fund that with contribution or rollover or transfer or some combination of those things. So the, the funding can be partial or full. So if you have an old 401k at a company where you no longer work and you wanna roll that over, absolutely fine. Uh, if you have a, another IRA and you wanted to move half of that or some, some scenario like that, all that is fine. Uh, again, your, con your uh, level of control is often more than you might have thought previously. And then once that account is open and it has some money, then you're just looking for the investment. So you go to your financial team, you go to meetings, however it is that you research the type of investments that you want, you choose those. And again, we help you to make sure that the documentation is appropriate so that you get to keep the tax benefits. But there's a wide range of things that you can invest in. So I will pause here for IRA questions and, and peruse the questions uh, really quickly, but we may go back to uh, these at the end. And I think that these questions are, are, are things that we will address at the end. So I appreciate everybody starting to type these in. So please feel free to continue to do that as we move through the presentation. And again, it was my pleasure to kind of host the event here and I'll be back in the question and answer period. But at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rocky Butani of privatelenderlink.com, founder and CEO. And Rocky runs a really interesting and robust private lending site. And it's gonna be able to give us some insights for, uh, for people who like us, individual investors, and sometimes uh, investors with our IRAs who wanna participate in this asset class. So Rocky, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Cliff. Okay, well, I'm gonna let you uh, go ahead and take over then. Okay, all right. Thanks for having me here and uh, glad to be with everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about a few different topics related to private lending, including the types of loans that private lenders typically make, the risk profile for a typical private mortgage loan, and that really means loan to value and loan to cost, uh, and what the current impacts are of, of the coronavirus uh, pandemic on private lending, and how IRA investors can participate in private mortgage loans, and then also the typical returns for private mortgage investing. So let's get right into it. All right, so before we get into all the details, uh, just a little bit of background about myself and Private LenderLink. So I formed or I founded and built PrivateLenderLink.com uh, personally in 2010. And it, when it first started, its primary function was to be a directory of 
select private mortgage lending companies uh, throughout the country, and uh, it, it's evolved over the last 10 years. And um, we have about 135 lenders that are listed on the platform. Not all of them show up in searches, but uh, there's about another uh, 200 or so uh, lenders that that I know and and have uh, have met. I attend a lot of industry events uh, throughout the years, and um, and and I like to meet a lot of these lenders, shake their hands, get to know them. Whenever I travel, I'll I'll try to visit lenders' offices and really get to to really establish a relationship with them uh, beyond just having them listed on private lender link. In uh, in about 2000. Uh, 17 or 18, the the site expanded into uh, you know being more of an information resource for everything related to private lending. So there's a directory of investment of, uh, opportunities, uh, industry service providers, uh, industry events, uh, and and a few other items. Um, and then just a quick disclaimer, you know, private lender link is licensed by the California Department of Real Estate. But we don't have a securities license, and and we don't, uh, you know, we're not a fiduciary or an agent. You know, as far as our role in the industry is very unique, where we don't originate any loans, we don't lend any money, uh, we, you know, we're really more of a marketing company, and uh, and that's, um, you know, that also, uh, as it relates to this presentation, is is really an information source for. Um, for investors and for lenders. So uh, I just wanted to define a, a couple of uh, things. You know, when we talk about private lending, it's really related to mortgages. Uh, there are some private business lenders, um, but but this presentation is really focused on on mortgage lending, and and our role in the industry is uh, as mortgages and and not um, unsecured loans or business loans. Um, and uh, private lending uh, or private mortgage lending is also known as hard money. Some people call it private money, and some people just refer to them as bridge loans. And uh, I talked to a few, uh, or I talked to a lot of real estate investors who who think that the word private money means that uh, the loans are funded by an individual and not a company, and hard money to them means that it's a it's a lending company and they're going to charge points, but most of the lenders that I know don't like calling themselves a hard money lender, so they like to use the word private money. But if from from my perspective, they're really all the same, and uh, I just wanted to um, clarify that. And and also as far as the parties involved, you know, I talked to some individual investors who call themselves a lender, and and then there is um, you know some people who are a property investor call themselves an investor, but for the purposes of this presentation. Um, the the borrower that's pretty straightforward. That's the real estate investor, um, and the and when I say lender, I mean the loan originator uh, who 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 sourced the deal and they deal with the borrower and and the investor is really providing the capital. So some of the characteristics of a private mortgage loan, uh, the majority of them are business purpose only. It's not for consumer purposes or someone buying their own house that they're going to live in. It's it's uh, it's mostly for real estate investors. And the collateral could be residential investment property, let's say a single family rental or a condo that's rented out, or it could be a commercial property. Uh, most of the loans are first lien position. There are some lenders in my network that do uh, offer second mortgages. Uh, they are definitely a lot more risky. The majority of the lenders I know that do seconds are, are doing them in California. And uh, throughout the country, there's a lot of lenders that do larger commercial real estate deals that that don't mind doing junior liens, but they typically refer to them as mezzanine loans. So the majority are first lien position. Uh, they're typically shorter term. Uh, most loans range between six months and 24 months. I have seen some lenders that do loans for a few days where the borrower uh, is purchasing a property and they already have a buyer lined up and they just need the loan for a few days. But the majority of loans are written at a 12-month term. And what I find is most lenders or investors want at least six months of interest payments. So there's a six month prepayment penalty. Uh, some lenders don't have a prepayment penalty. They don't really think the loan's gonna get paid off in a month, but um, they offer uh, to the borrowers to the option to not have any fees if, if they end up paying off the loan a lot earlier. 
And uh, there are some lenders out there that will lend, loan, will do loans up to five years and sometimes even longer. There's, uh, especially in the last few years, there's been a lot of companies that offer a 30 year rental loan. And uh, some investors also like, uh, like having a longer term uh, with that steady income. Uh, another characteristic of private mortgages is their their higher uh, costs. There's you know they're definitely more expensive than going to a bank. There's interest, uh, then there's origination fees, and there may be other fees involved. And the majority of uh, the payment structures are interest only. There are some lenders that do amortize their loans for uh, 20 years or even 30 years, but maybe the loans do in in five years or less. Um, but I'd say 95% of of the loans are structured as interest-only payments. Sorry for the delay, there's, uh, I'm just trying to advance the slide here. Okay, and uh, you might be wondering why private lending is not for consumer purposes. And the reason is primarily uh, government regulations. Uh, each state has their own regulations, but uh, most of the time, if you're lending on an owner-occupied home, or even if it's pulling money out of a, uh, an investment property to use for consumer purposes, uh, you have to do full documentation. It takes a lot longer. And, and the other thing from the lender's perspective is it's, it's a little more difficult to foreclose on a property. If there's a default and it's an owner-occupied home, uh, the, the owner or the borrower may lawyer up and, and then file a lawsuit claiming predatory lending and in a lot of states and a lot of cases, uh, the borrower will win and, and the lender will lose out. So most private lenders just avoid owner-occupied homes altogether. I have met a few companies that do like owner-occupied homes. There's a few in California that, that will lend for consumer purposes. It's still higher interest rate, uh, but they have the infrastructure to collect the documentation and process the loans and they're, they're comfortable with them. So there are a few cases for that. And the reason why most people borrow from a private lender is primarily timing to close. It's usually people are buying a property, they're gonna do a fix and flip project. Uh, they need to close within a few days or, or no more than two weeks. And that's a typical time frame for most private mortgages is, is uh, seven to 10 days. Uh, the other reason is uh, the borrower was rejected by the bank for a number of reasons. Either they don't qualify financially, the property is vacant, it's in poor condition, and a bank won't touch those types of properties, or it's a specialty property type like a gas station or maybe a, a cannabis uh, grow facility, things like that. Uh, there, and then the different types of private mortgage loans that lenders offer, uh, it could be a straight purchase. This is, a, this is one that's, um, that every private lender will, will consider. It's, the borrower is buying a property and they just need a bridge loan to, to acquire the property and, and then uh, they'll, they'll pay off the lender within one or two years. Uh, refinance is also a, a common use for private lending. Someone has a loan coming due uh, and, uh, and they can't qualify for a bank for whatever reason, so they use a private lender as a bridge. Uh, and then sometimes with a, with a refinance loan, the borrower might need uh, some equity cash out and they need to use that money for a business purpose. Uh, they want to invest in another investment property, they want to, they have a, a business that they operate and they need working capital. Um, so those are common uses. And as long as the funds are, are used for a business purpose, then a lender or a private lender will consider it. And the borrower has to document in writing and actual handwriting that, you know, they're not going to use the funds for a consumer purpose. And fix and flip is one of the most common types of loans offered by private lenders. Um, uh, most of the lenders on private lender link offer fix and flip loans, uh, or it could be a rehab loan that, that um, the borrower is planning to rent the property once the rehab's completed. But fix and flip is the most desirable for lenders because there's a clear exit strategy. They, they know that the, the, the property is going to have some a, a added value with the renovations, and they know that the borrower is planning to sell it, and they're going to get their money back. Uh, ground up construction is less common uh, in the industry. There's not a lot of lenders that are comfortable with ground up construction. The challenge is if, if you have to foreclose on a ground up construction midway, uh, 
the lender has to have the capability to take over that project and have the crew ready to, to complete the construction and then sell the property to get their money back. And long-term rental, as I said, uh, it, it's, it's fairly new in the private lending industry on a large scale uh, because most private loans are short-term up to two years or maybe three years. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of options for, for real estate investors that just buy a property uh, and, and want to hold it for a long time. But there's a, a lot of companies that started offering a 30-year rental loan and as an alternative to a bank, and that was a really popular product over the last two years or so. And as far as the risk profile, if, um, you know, if, if you're, someone's buying a property, a private lender will typically go up to 70% of the purchase price. So the borrower has to bring in 30% of their own cash. There are some lenders that will be okay with a borrower having a partner or a second or a junior lien holder that makes up that difference. But typically, most lenders want to see the borrower putting in some of their own cash so they have some equity in the deal and they have something to lose. But from a first lien perspective, the, the investor or the lender doesn't want to be at more than 70% of, of the purchase price. And th there could be a situation where the borrower is buying the property at a discount and, and it's, it's really worth, uh, let's say it's, it's really worth $100,000 thousand dollars but they're buying it for seventy thousand usually the lender will will not really look at the perceived value and and they'll just lend on the purchase price and that's usually the safer way to go and if it's a refinance what i've seen for most lenders is they don't go as high as they would on a purchase they'll max out at 65 percent of of the as is value and that's the same thing if you're doing an equity cash out uh, or and even if it was a second mortgage the combined loan to value can't be more than 65%. So there's there's a good cushion of, of equity in case the borrower defaulted or in case uh, the market uh, drops and, and values drop. For any kind of rehab loan, fix and flip or, or rehab and hold, uh, most lenders will fund up to 80% of the purchase price and then 100% of the renovation costs on a draw basis. As long as the completed or the loan to completed value is no more than 65%. Over the last four or five years, there have been a lot of lenders in the market that have offered much higher leverage than 80% of the purchase price, where they'll fund 90% of the purchase price or even 100% financing, and the borrower has uh, has much less uh, of an equity stake in, in the property. Um, so that's been very common over the last few years. For ground up construction, these are again very risky. But but if someone's purchasing land, lenders typically fund only up to 50% of the land purchase price. Uh, but once the property shovel ready and uh, they're ready to go vertical, then they'll fund up to 75% of the construction costs. I, I have seen some lenders that will fund 100% of the construction costs, but as long as the loan to completed value is 65% or less. And for long-term rentals over the last few years, I've seen lenders typically go up to 70% of the stabilized value, um, but there have been some lenders that will go up 75, maybe 80. 80 is probably the, the absolute highest. Um, even, even that's a little high for private lending, but um, I say 70% is, is a bit more common. Uh, as far as credit score, the majority of lenders uh, in, that I've seen, uh, they don't typically have a minimum credit score some lenders don't even check credit at all. Uh, a lot of lenders do want to run the credit report just to make sure there's uh, there's nothing major in there that wasn't disclosed, like a bankruptcy or a foreclosure. Uh, and then and then there are a number of lenders that do have a minimum credit score, and and that's usually 620, or for some lenders is 640. So it just depends on the lenders. I've I've seen it go 50-50, where some don't have a minimum credit score and some do. Uh, as far as foreclosing on a property, uh, this varies by state. So uh, there's some states throughout the country that have what's called a non-judicial foreclosure process, where where the the property is sold at an auction. It's uh, it, it's less than 90 days typically, some even 30 days. It depends on the state. Uh, and then there's some states throughout the country where, uh, you know, New York is is probably the the best example I could give where most lenders that are lending in New York, 
expect the foreclosure process to take two years. And uh, there are some states that have a judicial foreclosure process where where the, the foreclosure has to go through a court and it's not just sold at an auction. And uh, there are some states that, that are not as backlogged as New York. So New York's probably the, uh, the most extreme example, but some states maybe it could take six months. It's still, when you're dealing with a court process, it, it definitely takes longer. Um, but, but foreclosure is, is um, uh, you know, it, it's not, it hasn't been very common in, in the last few years. Uh, it, it seems I haven't heard too many stories about, about foreclosures uh, in the last several years. So as far as the coronavirus situation, uh, it's, it's definitely affected the private lending space. Uh, there's a lot of lenders that have stopped lending completely. And, and the ones that have stopped, the majority of them are fairly new in the industry. They've, uh, let's say they've only been around for maybe five years and their business model was to fund the loans with their own money and then immediately sell the loan to uh, a Wall Street backed company or a hedge fund. Uh, that that have that appetite for buying uh, these private or hard money loans, and and once the market uh, took a di uh, took a dip uh, in March, uh, a lot of those institutional uh, loan buyers had had just turned off the faucet and told all their lending partners that hey we're not buying anything right now, and and so the lenders haven't been able to lend. Um, those uh, those capital providers may come back in the near future and and reduce their guidelines. Generally, they've they've been really high leverage. You know, like with fix and flip loans, they've they've purchased loans that where the borrower only put down 15% or 10%, and and they still had an appetite for that. So they may come back with with much tighter guidelines and be more conservative. Um, and then there are some lenders I've seen that are just waiting on sidelines. They have the capital, but they have a feeling that that values are going to drop, and and they're not sure what's going to happen. So they're just holding on. Uh, to their money, um, and and every lender is going to have that uh, that con you know that um, concern about valuation. So some lenders I've talked to are, are anticipating uh, once the shutdowns are over throughout the country, uh, we may see values start to drop. So that's definitely on the minds of most lenders. Um, if if someone's doing a fix and flip project or a construction. It's a bit harder now to do inspections, and even if you can do an appraisal, you know appraisals are getting, uh, uh, you know, they're going through a transformation where they're allowing people to use their cell phones to take photos or videos. Uh, but if 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 a property does need to be inspected, that there are challenges with that. Some lenders in my network will actually visit every single property they fund, even if it's in a different state from where they're located. They'll typically fly to view the property, and uh, that's obviously a challenge now as well. And closing processes are taking a lot longer than they normally would. Uh, this has to do with settlement, a title and escrow companies, and uh, and the legal process with with closing a loan. So there are still lenders that are still lending, and and these are typically lenders that have uh, control of their own capital. They could be a debt fund, or uh, they're backed by individual investors that are still um, that are still pretty liquid. Uh, what's happened with with the guidelines is everyone's gotten a lot more conservative. Loan to values, the maximum, if it was 70% before, there are some lenders that are dropping that uh, to 65 or even 60%. Uh, and same thing with loan to cost. I've found some lenders still willing to do rehab and construction, but but they're asking the borrower to put more money down. And if before they were only asking for 20% down payment, now they may ask for 25 or 30 percent, and uh, pricing is increasing. So there, there's only a handful of lenders I've talked to that have not increased their pricing because their cost of capital hasn't changed, and they don't want to pass on uh, any any additional amounts to the borrower. But the majority of of lenders are increasing their pricing, and I'll go over the the general pricing for private lending uh, here in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, and then as far as experience, over the last several years, I've seen a lot of lenders that, that will lend to inexperienced borrowers, especially for fix and flip. Uh, that's what we mean when we talk about experience. Experience with purchasing a property, fixing it up, and successfully flipping it and making a profit. Uh, 
nowadays the no one's really looking at inexperienced borrowers they're only taking the, the ones that have completed at least three maybe even five or ten properties in the last year or so and being very selective about the borrowers and some are even now you know checking the credit and, and having a higher minimum credit score requirement uh, some lenders are also being selective about property types this is more in the commercial space but in commercial real estate, I've found a number of lenders that won't touch retail now, or they won't do hotels. They're really focused on multifamily and industrial properties. Those seem to be the two most popular at this time. Uh, and 30-year rental loans, the reason uh, a lot of lenders were doing these 30-year rental loans in the last two years or so is because there was an appetite for it on Wall Street. All these hedge funds and Wall Street-backed uh, note buyers were were really interested in, in these 30-year rental loans because they would buy them, package them up uh, as a security and sell them off. So because the, the Wall Street type capital providers are, are on hold, the 30-year rental loan is the least desirable um, product. So they've, uh, they've really cut that off. And there's only one lender I know of that, that still does 30-year rental loans, but they don't sell them to Wall Street companies. So with that, there's now a huge demand for, for new capital sources. So in the last five years, because the, uh, the hedge funds came into the private lending space, it, a lot of new private lending companies had started and, and had that model where they could easily just fund a loan and sell it. So the competition has really increased since 2014 or 15. Um, and, and, and even lending companies that were around before 2015 that would typically sell their, or either sell their loans or have their loans funded by an individual investor, uh, that comes with, with a little bit of extra work from the lender's uh, point of view. Um, so with all that new capital that came into the market, it, it was a lot easier for, for lenders to uh, you know, instead of going to an individual investor and saying, hey, will you fund this loan? They could just fund it and sell it, and it was an easier model for them. So it seems like because of that, a lot of individual investors were neglected over the last several years. And the other thing with all the hedge fund money is it was cheaper. So a lender could fund a loan at, at 9% and then sell it to, uh, to a hedge fund at, at 7 and, and have a 2% spread. And, and also uh, lenders have more control when, uh, when, you know, when, they, when they just use their own balance sheet to, to fund a loan and then sell it. There's a number of lenders I've seen that have used a, a bank warehouse line um, to, to have the capital on their balance sheet to fund the loans. But uh, this also happened in 2008 and it's starting to happen now where, where a lot of these warehouse lines are, are getting pulled and, and lenders no longer have access to that warehouse line. So, um, so now there's a, a big demand to, to get loans funded by individual investors and a number of lenders have reached out to me and, and have asked if, if I know of any individual investors that, uh, that they can send their loans to, to either purchase or to get them funded at closing. Um, and then also the other thing is, is the, the yields. The, another reason that individual investors have been neglected over the last several years is a lot of investors want a higher yield than than let's say what's you know what's typically required for a hedge fund uh, if a hedge fund says hey we need six or seven percent uh, then a, an individual investor typically has a higher yield requirement and and that's why a lot of lenders have have neglected uh, individuals as well so there's there's six ways that I uh, that I came up with where an where an individual investor can invest in private mortgages. Uh, the first one is to lend directly to the borrower, uh, where there's no intermediary and and let's say you're the investor, you know the borrower, or you got introduced to the borrower, you underwrite the deal yourself. Uh, this is this is really for experienced investors because you have to really underwrite the property, underwrite the borrower. Uh, in some states, you're not allowed to do this yourself. You you can't advertise to the public that you're a lender. California is one example of that, um, where you do need a license. Um, and uh, the, the one of the benefits for lending directly to the borrower is you can charge them points. 
Um, you can still charge points in certain states, uh, even uh, you know, even if there was uh, an originator involved, but but you have the potential to to ask for points, and you can even do a profit split where if it's uh, a fix and flip property, you could tell the borrower, hey, at the end of the deal, I want 20% of the profits. Uh, another uh, option, which is which is a lot more common, uh, is is where an investor uh, is presented with a deal and and says, yeah, I want to fund it, and they and they fund the whole amount. So the loan originator or what I call the lender does all the underwriting. They'll take the borrower's application, they'll vet, vet the deal as much as possible, and then they'll present uh, the opportunity to an investor and uh, and then the investor will say, "Yeah, sure, I want to I want to do that loan." And and then the investor is, um, uh, you know, is is on the deed of trust. They're the sole note holder uh, for that loan. The uh, one other advantage is there's no direct communication with the borrower uh, during the underwriting process. Uh, the the downside is as a loan originator will take that loan and and may send it out to multiple investors. So if you don't Responded them right away. Some other investor might take it. There are some uh, lenders I know that that will take their time and and uh, and just send it to one investor at a time. Uh, it just kind of depends on 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 their timing. If if they're in a hurry to to get it funded, they may uh, send it out to multiple investors, and then uh, you as an investor would be competing, and you'd have to you'd have to really make a decision quickly. Uh, option three is to is similar to option two, but you're not funding the entire loan amount, you're funding just a fractional amount, and there's other investors involved in the loan. So the, the deed of trust is divided up where each investor has um, has a deed and it's it's a fractional investment. Uh, the, one of the benefits is, is it's a smaller investment amount that's required. So if you're funding a, a $500,000 loan and there's five investors, your, uh, your portion of that loan may be uh, maybe 100,000 instead of the whole 500,000. Um, and, and this allows everyone to diversify their portfolio and spread the risk and, and share the risk with others. Option number four is the lender funds the loan with their own money and then, and then an investor purchases the loan once it's been funded. Uh, the, the reason a lot of lenders like this model and, and ones that, that use the warehouse lines is because they want to make a decision quickly, fund the loan quickly, and then they could take their time to uh, sell the loan right after to recapitalize, and and it's less pressure for everyone, and uh, and this is this is definitely a common uh, method for for a lot of lenders, and even some lenders could fund the loan with their own money and 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 sell the note as uh, a fractional, or or they could or they could sell it all to one investor. Option number five is a debt fund or a mortgage pool, as it's commonly known, uh, where uh, where the investor uh, is is a as a shareholder, uh, it has an equity stake in in a fund, and this is really only open to accredited investors that have a net worth of at least one million dollars, and there's a certain um, income level that you have to meet to be considered accredited. Uh, the the big difference with this type of investment is it's it's very passive the fund manager makes all the decisions they fund the loan and and they'll let you know later on hey we funded this loan it's in our portfolio um, so the investor has very low control uh, a debt fund it, it does have to register with the with the securities and exchange commission um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, debt funds forming even nowadays it, it, it became more common um, in the last five years or so, there are some lenders I've seen that have started out with with the model of of doing one investor one loan, and then they eventually formed a debt fund because they they just want more control of the deals, and uh, some some investors prefer a passive investment and don't want to have to try to make a decision on every loan and and uh, do their own you know work, underwriting on on each deal. The sixth option, which is not very common uh, these days, is crowdfunding. And when the Jobs Act uh, came out in 2012, there's a number of companies that uh, that formed to be crowdfunding, where they would take small amounts of money from from uh, a large number of investors. And uh, it's uh, you know 
the, the reason a lot of lenders moved away from crowdfunding is because it's it, it's a lot more difficult on their part. They it because it's highly regulated by the SEC. They have a lot more uh, compliance requirements. Uh, but similar to debt fund, the uh, the manager of the fund can make the decision and make the investments and um, the good thing for an investor is, is it's a very small investment amount. It could be a minimum of $1,000 or $10,000. You don't have to invest large sums into them. Uh, a debt fund may have some minimum requirements as far as the money you invest, and I'll, I'll go over those here in, in just a short amount of time. Um, so the typical interest rates for most private mortgages is 7% uh, at the very low end and 15% uh, at the high end. Um, in California, there's a lot more competition. There's a lot more lenders. So the rates have typically been lower in California compared to the rest of the country. So in California, uh, most loans are between 7 and 9%. And nowadays, they've come up to about 10%. And the second mortgage is much more risk. So those have always been a little bit higher, ranging from 10% to 12%. And as far as the minimum investment amounts, for for most whole loans, I, I don't really see a lot of lenders funding loans less than fifty thousand. There are some uh, in certain parts of the country, but fifty thousand is typically the minimum loan amount for most lenders uh, in my network. If you're doing a fractional loan uh, or a fractional investment in a loan, uh, the minimum is typically ten thousand uh, dollars. For a debt fund, there's a, a lot of debt funds I know that that have a, uh, a minimum requirement of fifty thousand or a hundred thousand. Uh, some go down to 25,000, whatever that amount is. What I've heard from a lot of fund managers is um, they, they may consider taking a smaller amount than what they advertise because they want to start the relationship and they want the investor to start with a small amount. And once they get to know the fund and, and they've seen some results, then they can increase their investment. And the minimum for crowdfunding is about $1,000. And uh, uh, like I said, there's not too many of them. There's There's a few larger companies that that offer a crowdfunding investment option and loan servicing is another thing i should touch on very briefly loan servicing is really the process of collecting the payments uh, there are some lenders who like to keep that in-house and that's really part of their business model so they'll fund a loan at uh, 10 percent the bar is paying 10 percent and then when the loan uh or, or when the investor comes in the investor is getting 9% and the loan originator keeps that 1% spread, but they'll service the loan. They'll make sure the payments are coming in. If there's any foreclosure issues uh, or default, they'll deal with, with all the paperwork and the whole process of, um, of collecting on that. There are a number of investors I know that like to service the loans themselves. Um, this requires a lot of work, but if an investor has the infrastructure for that, then, uh, um, then that's definitely an option. And then the third option is just to outsource it to a third party because it is it could get a, very complicated to service loans. So I've I've seen a number of of lenders and investors collectively agree to just outsource it to a third party. Okay, and and that covers all the information about about private lending that I have for now. Um, as far as resources, you know, there's a lot of private lending companies out there. It, it's a lot of work to call them up and say, hey, I want to invest, uh, because some of them aren't even looking for investors. They may not have a fund. They may have enough investors and not taking on any new ones, or they may not even have that model. They may be funding the loans and then selling them off, and, and they don't deal with in the investors. So uh, we set up a, a directory on private lender link to list companies that are seeking investors. So you can always use that as a resource. It's open to the public. Uh, all the lenders that are on there just pay a flat monthly fee to advertise. It, there's no commission that we earn on uh, if you contact any of the companies. So it's an open resource. So it's privatelenderlink.com slash investments. There's about, at this time, 20 companies on there. You can filter by trustee investing, or if you prefer a fund, you can find some debt funds on there and you could read a little bit more about them and then reach out to them directly. You can call them or fill out a very short form on their profile page and then they'll respond to you directly. And, uh, and they'll send you all the information about their investment uh, uh, opportunity. And then uh, you'd have to do your own due diligence on that. Um, there, the other option we have on Private Lender Link is for an investor to create a profile. You can sign up 
uh, and create an investor account and then post your criteria and only a few at this time only a, a handful of uh, select loan originators will will have access to that information and um, and if uh, if they're a fit then they can reach out to you so that's a, another option that you have on our platform other resources I could recommend law firms could be a great source of of information because they help form debt funds they know a lot of lenders in the industry uh, maybe even more than I do um, so one of the one of the I'm going to give you the two top law firms throughout the country uh, that that are specialists in private mortgages. Uh, Jurassic LLP is a law firm based in Irvine, California, and uh, they do uh, a wide variety of services like fund formation and litigation. But they're a great company and they know a lot of different private lenders, so they may be able to refer you to one of their clients. Um, so their website is JurassicLawFirm.com. Uh, the other company is, um, you know, it, it's a long name, but it, it's really John Hornick is is the attorney um, uh, for this company that that deals with private mortgages, and that's a specialty. So their website is Private Lender Law. Um, so John Hornick is based in uh, New Jersey, and a lot of his clients are in the East Coast, but they they do offer services throughout the country. And the same thing with Jurassi Law Firm is uh, they they both do uh, services nationwide. Uh, there's also uh, uh, just three trade associations in our industry. The American Association of Private Lenders uh, is a national uh, trade association. I've been going to their events for the last seven years. Uh, you can use them as a resource if you need uh, any recommendations. Um, and uh, National Private Lenders Association is fairly new, uh, but uh, they serve a similar purpose. They all do um, uh, lobbying for the industry and and they could be a good resource. Uh, the third one, California Mortgage Association has been around for a very long time. Uh, I am a member and uh, I'm on the marketing committee and it's a very good organization. So if you need uh, any recommendations for any lender in uh, or investment opportunity in California, they could be a good resource as well. Just one thing to mention about the trade associations is uh, Jurassic Law Firm is a partner, uh, part owner of the American Association of Private Lenders. And uh, John Hornick is uh, one of the founders of the National Private Lenders Association, just to mention that. Uh, and that's all I have for you. Um, uh, I guess Clay will uh, take it from here and uh, moderate all the questions and happy to answer any questions you have uh, right now. And you can always reach out to me after the webinar. Thanks, Rocky. Yeah, let's go ahead and go to some some of the questions here. If you have questions that are still on your mind, uh, please go ahead and type them into the questions box, and we will get to as many of these as we can. And uh, yeah, let me go ahead and put uh, both our contact information, just in case uh, we don't get to something that you that you wanted to have answered, or if you want to fo have follow up questions as well, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, I know that uh, both of us would be happy to help you with further information. Okay, let's see. I've been attempting to get detailed answers to the CARES Act and its relationship to SDIRAs. And will you guys provide recommendations for subject matter experts to answer the question satisfactorily? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can say that we did a, a webinar on that very recently, um, and that may have the answer to the questions that you are looking for. So I would recommend that on our YouTube channel. and. Uh, and see where that is. And if you have questions to, to follow up uh, beyond that, we're happy to uh, answer them if we can. And if we can't, uh, maybe direct you someplace where you can get the information. Um, next question also looks like an IRA question. So I'll go ahead and take this. Can you make an investment in an entity in which you are 25% owner with three other independent partners? Is this a disqualified entity or no? So I'm assuming that you're talking about your IRA making this investment. And right off the top, uh, the percentage of ownership, 25%, if you already personally own 25%, that doesn't necessarily make it a dis, uh, disqualified entity. The, it would, some, to some extent, make a difference whether you are the, uh, the sole decision maker. So if the 25% ownership includes you basically controlling the entire entity, that may have an impact on whether it's considered to be disqualified or not. But from an ownership percentage, it's not necessarily 
That said, your IRA could not purchase the 25% that you already own. So if your IRA wanted to make a purchase into that entity, that might be possible, um, but it would need to be buying uh, the shares from a, a, disqual a non-disqualified person. A copy of the presentation today, absolutely. Um, the uh, everybody will actually get a uh, an email that has a a link to the the presentation, so the entire recording. Um, so we're happy for you to review that and uh, and you know follow up with any questions that you might have. Next question: Will Advanta facilitate networking with other SDIRA holders interested in private lending? You know, unfortunately, no. The um, one of the the things about being a, uh, a provider of these types of accounts is we are a really, really neutral part of the equation. And so under any circumstances, we're not really allowed to put our account holders um, with investments. And, you know, typically speaking, the networking events and uh, sites that, uh, that put those two pieces of the puzzle together are things that we stay away from just because we need to, to maintain the neutrality that, that kind of is our, our business model. It, I, I understand the question and I, I totally get it, but I, I'm unfortunately not. Uh, can a self-directed IRA invest directly in debt financed real estate? I'm gonna say yes. And if it's a property that's already existing and with debt financing, I'm not entirely sure what the structure you're talking about. So I'm happy to get into more detail uh, with you about that. Um, but absolutely, an IRA can purchase real estate, but can also have debt involved in the uh, in the purchase. So an IRA can actually take out a loan, uh, a non-recourse loan is what it's typically called, uh, to extend its buying power and to uh, secure a property. Can a loan be made to qualified persons for the borrower's purchase of an asset from an unqualified person? A loan be made to a person, the borrower's person. Well, I'm assuming this is an IRA question, so I will say this. Yes, an IRA can loan to a person. Uh, the only real restriction there is that it's a, a non-disqualified person. And the the end result of the money for the borrower in large part doesn't make any difference to the IRS in terms of the IRA's participation. So generally speaking, the IRS's rules have to do with who that IRA makes the loan to. So non-disqualified persons is a requirement there. If a California self-directed IRA uh, originates a loan, does the IRA need to have a CFL license? Rocky, I'm actually going to defer to you. There's not a, I, I don't know what the, the state rules are out there. Do you? Um, I'm, I'm not really the best person to ask. It's more of a, a compliance legal question, but the the licensing is is primarily for lending companies that do lending as a, as a business and, and they put themselves out there in the public. Uh, I, I don't think uh, someone in, you know, I don't think the IRA investing in the loan needs to have a CFL license, but I, th I think one of the attorneys that I mentioned in my presentation uh, can quickly answer that. Okay, great. Okay, heard about CrowdStreet from one of the, uh, for an advanced webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, would you like to, would like to know the difference between private lending and CrowdStreet type of lending and the risk involved? Uh, do you want to weigh in on that, Rocky? From what I know about CrowdStreet, I think they uh, they really acquire property. So I believe they're more of an equity play instead of instead of debt. I'm I'm not sure if they do any any debt investments or any any lending. For, but I I did meet uh, one of the founders of CrowdStreet at a conference, and and I, I do remember them saying that they acquire properties and and they're not really on the debt side. But that may have changed in the last year or two. And the risk involved, am, am I understanding from your presentation today, Rocky, that the risk involved has to do with the structure and the property and that, and that type of thing? Um, 
Correct. Yeah. The, the risk profile is, is yes, it's it's a combination of, of the loan to value or loan to cost, uh, the underlying collateral, and, and also the borrower to some extent. Okay. If one deposits the proceeds of a, a real estate sale back into one's Roth IRA, how much and at what time can those proceeds above the initial purchase price be withdrawn from the IRA? That's a good question. So the um, there's really no time restriction. So as soon as cash has cleared your cash position in your IRA, you could make the decision on what happens to it. So that could be a distribution, uh, meaning that you take it back into your personal financial world or you redeploy it and, and reinvest it. Um, and that goes for the initial purchase price too. So the, the total gross proceeds uh, when they come back into the IRA, again, once they've, they've cleared the account, um, you know, and if it's a wire, that's almost instantaneously, next day usually, uh, those proceeds are ready to be redeployed or distributed. What interest rates are you seeing on these loans funded through the IRA? Uh, excellent question. It's a, it's a broad range and I actually don't have statistics on that. We, we don't track that kind of thing. Um, so maybe a question for you, Rocky, is individual investors, when they are uh, participating in these, do you do you see a trend in terms of what they're getting on their returns? Uh, it, it varies by different area, but it, it's also determined by the market. So the loan originator will will typically tell the investor, look, you know, we've got this deal on the table, but I know you want 12% return, but it's not realistic. There's a lot of competition. Uh, the you know, the more realistic interest rate for this loan is going to be, let's say, for example, 10%. And the, and the investor can say, okay, well, sure, I'll, I'll take 10% or, or no, that's too low for me. So it, it's really dictated by the market. And, and there, there's also, like I said earlier, about, about how the loan originator may even take a, a, a percentage of the total interest that's collected. Um, or if you're investing in, in a debt fund, even though the fund's lending out money with an average interest rate of of 10%, uh, you have to, you know, there's all the costs that are associated with operating the fund. The manager takes their fee of 1% or 2%. So in that case, the investor may get 7 to 8%, um, which is lower than the interest rate that the borrower pays. But on average, I think I think most individual investors, if you're doing uh, a loan on one individual property. Uh, what I've seen throughout the country is typically in the range of nine to ten percent. Okay. And the the in answer to your question from an IRA perspective, IRAs are receiving it's the same it's the same investment whether it's your IRA money or you're not. So you can basically extrapolate whatever non-IRA money is making and that's the same same as the IRA other than that there's you know obviously the tax advantages. Um, what are the rules around investing in real estate or lending to a company outside the United States? Uh, from a from an IRS perspective and, and for your IRA that that is allowable so the the rules to some extent have to do with the rules about either investing in real estate or lending in that country. So the, and that's something that definitely needs some investigation because it's an interesting thing. Uh, some countries don't really have a, a great concept of what an American IRA is, even though it's probably, you know, from our perspective, it's, it's viable for the IRA to invest in that country. The actual ability to do so, you know, can be more or less complicated depending upon the, the territory. Um, do you serve as a broker for the sale of existing private loans? So Rocky, I think that one's for you. That for me? Uh, no, no, definitely not. Um, there, uh, th there's a there's a company that uh, that I know really well that's that's building a platform uh, for uh, for people to sell loans or or for you know for loan originators to find uh, to find investors, and, and that could be an option. Um, and, and full disclosure, I have helped them with, with designing it and, and building that platform, but it's really owned by them. It's a company called Liquid Logics, and, and I think they're going to be ready to launch it within, uh, within the next week or two, uh, but that could be an option. Uh, I don't really see companies out there that, you know, I'm sure they're out there. I just don't know anyone that really brokers the sale of loans. It's usually 
uh, the company that originates the loan or, or what I call the lender, uh, they already have a network of investors and, uh, and they, you know, they sell to them directly. There's not really brokers involved, except if it's a big portfolio of loans, that's when I see more brokering, but, but usually it's direct. Um, so, you know, if, if a lender does have that model of selling their loans, then as long as you're in their network, they'll present the opportunity to you and then, and then you can, you can buy the loan from them direct. Okay. Hey, we, we still have a few questions left, but I see that we've gone over time a little bit. So I'm going to uh, just do a couple of last quick things. One, one other question, and then I will make it. Uh, so yes, there will be a recording that's available to you. You get an email that comes out and, and has the recording available to you. And if you want the slides, just contact Rocky or myself and, uh, and we're happy to give you the information off those slides that you would like or, or, or get you the information that you need. Um, we're happy to do that as well. Um, so I got, there are several questions about that. So I wanted to just make sure, yes, yes, you can get the information, anything that you want to review from the presentation, um, we're happy to get that to you. And then last, last question I'm going to take, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up is do most individual lenders visit the property if they're investing in a lender originated property? Rocky. I, uh, it, it depends on if, if you're, if it's really in your local market, there are a lot of investors I've. I've met that that only lend in a in a certain area, or they only invest in in properties in a certain area because they want to go visit the property and and look at it and and drive around the neighborhood before they make a commitment to invest in the loan. So it really depends on the investor's preferences. I think the majority of the investors I've talked to, and also from from the originator's perspective, is the investor just relies on the lender or the loan originator. To do all that underwriting and drive by the property. In fact, there's a lot of debt funds I know where one of the one of the principles of the fund will themselves fly out to the property or drive the property, take photos and document it, and, and not just rely on an appraisal. Um, so it's really more of an investor's preference. But if you're if, if you're willing to invest in loans in in the entire state of California or or anywhere in the East Coast, then you're more likely not uh, not one of those investors that that has that requirement to drive by the property, but I, I think it is common for for investing locally. Okay, great. Well, I will. Uh, look, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the the presentation now. Thank you for your questions. If you asked a question and it didn't get answered, uh, we will answer those. Um, we'll, we have a, a list of the questions and we'll make sure that we reach out to you and answer your questions. So if you didn't get answered here on the presentation, I apologize for that. And we will definitely take care of getting you the information that you need. And for my part, I just want to say thanks for tuning in. And Rocky, thank you for joining us and, and providing all that information. Um, yeah. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And Rocky, that again, I had a couple of people at the end also say, it, it, is it okay with them, uh, with you for them to reach out and, and get your slides in particular? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I have a PDF file that I already exported and I'm happy to email that or put it on a Dropbox and share that. No problem at all. Yep. And we're happy to give you the slides as well. Well, thank you uh, for joining us, everybody. I hope it was informative and Please use us as a resource for further information. Our, our contact information is up on the screen. And enjoy the rest of your day and be safe and be healthy. Thank you, everyone.